co-host on the day, Two Star, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning there, Two Star. Good morning, Rob. I said it takes two of us today to fill in what John Gilscrap did all by himself yesterday. He was flying solo. He was flying solo, yeah. Did and, it well. And so now Maria and I, and you haven't introduced Maria yet, but I say the other person and I will try to fill in to mac- match John Gilstrap. Yeah, let me just say, as we welcome in Maria Lawrence, and that she seems incredibly relaxed, almost like she had a beach <laughs> vacation following a wedding, is the hour she's giving off right now. Maria, indeed, good morning. Indeed, indeed. Yes, yes. Good morning, and I'm happy to be back. You have the, the glow and the smile that only comes from somebody who just spent some week chilling with some friends at the beach. Yeah, we, we had a great time. Um, I had not been to, I'd been to Cape May before, not to the beach version just to the downtown for a day but you know spent three days and last week when it was 97 degrees here it was um you know probably low 80s if that there with a wonderful breeze and very relaxing and and you were introduced to the outdoor shower i was (laughs) communing with nature i was i was communing (laughs) with nature three women one bathroom um a bathroom outside uh, shower outside, take care of beach sand, and I was like, you know what, I can commune with nature out there. It please, was it was well hidden, so to please, speak. Please so. tell me that when you say there was a, a bathroom outside, you're not yeah. referring to the ocean. Please, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, clarify on that. Well, a shower outside. Oh, a shower different. outside, Rob. Sorry, yeah. I misspoke. Our guest to open up the program is uh, a guest who should be familiar to uh, much of our audience, Sam Petsonk. He's run for office Uh, Here in the past in the state of West Virginia, he is currently the second vice chair of the state's Democratic Party and is the West Virginia representative to the Democratic National Committee. Sam, good morning. Good morning, Rob. Good to hear you. Good to see you. Be here with you. Thank you. (laughs) Great to have you with us, uh, sir. How's life treating you these days? Life is treating me great. Summertime is upon us. Uh, uh, you know, no complaints down here. I'm taking my boys camping next week, so that that'll be something fun. Well, so for you the family. you know the outdoor shower then? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I remember doing some camping. You just you take a, a bar of soap, jump into the lake, and just start cleaning yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Old fashioned. Well. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it's, those days. Uh, I've, I've got a, I've got two little boys. Uh, they're just getting to the age where they, you know, they're they're in the scouts. They joined the Cub Scouts, and so we're having a lot of fun with that. How old are your, are your kids, there, Sam? They're they're four and uh, going to be seven here in a few weeks. Oh, so you can still control the baths when they get to be like twelve, thirteen. For some reason, they become bath averse, and it's <laughs> just like a battle getting them to guess get in the bathtub or the shower or whatever and boy the when the <laughs> hormones are kicking in yeah. and everything you're just like you got to take a shower dude <laughs> it yeah. is it is the, for whatever reason when you need the shower the most at some for whatever reason they Amen. don't want to shower during that Amen. period of time but enough of that people so. are stubborn <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh so uh tell me about your uh appointment to the uh dnc and how that came about well, you know, we just had our state Democratic convention uh, in, uh, uh, I guess it was weekend before last in Charleston, and we had uh, probably about 400 Democrats, I think, from all across West Virginia who were down there. It was a great convention, a lot of good uh, discussion and um, and work to mobilize for the upcoming elections. And one of the things that we do at that convention is elect our state and and, uh, federal representatives within the party. So I was uh, encouraged to seek that uh, opportunity to represent West Virginia on the Democratic National Committee, our longtime representative. There is an equal gender division on that national committee, uh, as there is on the state committee. So our longtime outgoing male representative was uh, a lawyer from Charleston, uh, Pat Maroney, who had served on the Democratic National Committee uh, as West Virginia's representative for quite a while. And he uh, sort of retired from that position, and uh, so some folks encouraged me to seek it, and uh, I, I, I had uh, unanimous support. I was really uh, encouraged and uh, excited about the opportunity. This is the role of the DNC, you know, is to set the strategy and the sort of the the um, the uh, organizing plan for the national party. So it's a pretty important role to, you know, make sure that West Virginia's priorities are reflected in the strategy and the values of the national party. 
Sam, let's go and uh, take this to the state party level for a moment. Uh, tell me about the health of the party at the West Virginia state level. Uh, how many uh, seats in the upcoming general election will you have, uh, as a percentage roughly, contested opponents running against Republicans? Um, I don't, I'm not sure on the specific number, but I tell you, we have a great complement of really strong candidates, uh, in, in, you know, from the top of the ticket to the bottom. We have um, some extraordinarily strong, uh, experienced office holders seeking, uh, you know, leading our ticket with Steve Williams, the three-time mayor of Huntington, who is running as the Democratic nominee for governor. Steve was unopposed in the primary, uh, but you couldn't uh, pick a more qualified and capable individual individual to uh, take the mantle leading the government of this state. So Steve Williams is a superb candidate and has a broad base. He comes out of the banking industry. He has, uh, you know, is very well known to mayors from, uh, you know, the eastern panhandle to the northern southern parts of the state he's he's a superb candidate same for our candidate for u.s senate two-time mayor of wheeling another major city in west virginia uh, glenn elliott is our nominee for uh, u.s senate superb candidate there we've got uh, teresa torreseva um, also from wheeling but a, a very well respected uh, lawyer um, a public advocate has represented uh, focused on representing in her career uh, the uh, the police Police officers and first responders across the state. I think Teresa's represented most every major uh, police department and um, and seeking you know fair wages and uh, fair compensation for our first responders. Really, it's a critical part of the job of the attorney general is uh, you know, protecting the public employees and the people of West Virginia. So. Uh, then all the way on down, we've got great candidates in the, in the Eastern Panhandle. I think we may have all but one of the races, all but one or two of those uh, House seats. We have people contending. We've got uh, Lucia Valentine in D uh, District 97, really dynamic young candidate there, um, seeking to serve in uh, Martinsburg. We have uh, Troy Miller uh, out of Carneysville on, on uh, House District 98. We've got... Um, Maria Russo in District 100, Shenandoah, she's out of Shenandoah Junction. We've got, I think, almost every uh, every one of the races up there. I don't know that we have a candidate in uh, District 99, but we've done pretty well, you know, uh, fielding candidates, and they're good candidates. You know, they're really dynamic and experienced, so I'm really proud of the candidates that we have up for election. And, uh, well, I should say we've got uh, Steve Wendelin running for uh, Congress, also a really interesting person, uh, you know, a, a veteran and uh, really insightful. So uh, the, we, I, I couldn't give you a number, but y I think you get the sense we've got some really strong candidates and uh, – and, and a diverse uh, array of candidates, bringing a lot of background and experience. And uh, that's that's what we try to do as a party. Tomorrow is the Biden-Trump debate. Your thoughts on that in advance of it, Sam? Well, I'm going to be watching. I think it'll be interesting. You know, so many people already formed their opinion about those two gentlemen. Uh, but it's, you know, the West Virginia Democratic Party, for our part, um, and we just we we just reaffirm this commitment at the state convention. You know, we are focused on building a better future for all. That means building modern infrastructure and equal opportunity for all. So, as far as West Virginia Democrats and West Virginia voters, I'd like to hear from those two candidates uh, what they plan to do over the next four years to improve our infrastructure and improve uh, the opportunities to build a better life for West Virginians. Uh, I'm going to be let me obviously. President Biden has presided over a massive, historic, bipartisan investment in, uh, in infrastructure and building American manufacturing. We have an industrial policy for the first time in this country, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law and, you know, Democratic leadership, largely Joe Manchin's leadership that made all of that happen. Uh, by my count, there's over 16 billion dollars in infrastructure and manufacturing jobs coming to West Virginia over the next decade uh, because of the Democratic industrial policy, the, the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. So I'd like to hear President Biden talk about that and explain how transformational those investments, public and private investment, and we've really spurred a lot of 
private sector um, energy in West Virginia because of those investments. You've got Warren Buffett investing in West Virginia, a lot of these new uh, battery companies that are building, uh, you know, electric battery, electric vehicle batteries um, and uh, all throughout the state now, and buses, boats, all kinds of new technology is is being manufactured in West Virginia. So I'd like to hear Biden talk about that and explain sort of where those investments will lead the American economy over the next four years. Maria. Um, Good morning, Sam. Um, Quick question. So I read a story and I believe it was Joe Manchin attending a fundraiser for Mr. Williams. Is that correct? Was it I can't remember if it was Mr. Williams, Mr. Elliott. It was Steve Williams. Okay, Steve Williams. Steve Williams, um, yes. He, did. he said he's planning, you know, they, those two have served together in the legislature. They're very well known to each other. I think Mr. Manchin is, uh, seems to be genuinely and enthusiastically supporting Steve Williams. So is that, um, is that a good move for the, for the Democratic Party, for, um, for Joe Manchin saying, okay, here I am, I'm, I'm stepping back? maybe um and and what exactly does that mean do you think well i think it means that you know joe manchin um is is trying to support good leaders you know for for the people of west virginia that's what he's always done he's always been a people person you know he's he's been a people person first and frankly you know that's that's a lot of west virginia politics it's about personalities and you know i'm the, i'm a democrat the democratic party uh, means means a lot to to west virginia has achieved a lot for west virginians uh and uh, i think that uh, that Joe Man- I, I hope Joe Manchin will continue to support Democrats in West Virginia because we're bringing the best people to the to the ballot, and uh, and that's uh, Steve Williams is a prime example of that. Like many West Virginians, you know, Senator Manchin thinks of himself as an independent now, but it doesn't mean he won't still wind up voting for Democrats. I hope he does every time, and and it's not because of the party necessarily, but it's because we're bringing the most competent and compelling people, and Steve's a great example of that. Bill? Yeah, good morning, Sam. Bill Stubblefield. A uh, couple of questions. One, just a numbers game. You mentioned there's going to be two representatives on the DNC from West Virginia. Is it safe to assume that every state will have two for a total of 100? Is that correct? Well, no, there's actually some more. The, uh, the, the state has two elected representatives, and then the um, – there are a variety of other roles that are uh, represented on the DNC, like, for instance, our uh, pre- uh, our uh, chair and vice chair of the state party are also DNC members, and there are uh, a handful of other Democratic-affiliated organizations that have voting representation on the DNC. So it's... Uh, so I, 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 I think it's closer to about four or five hundred. I don't know the, the total number offhand, but that's uh, that's in the order of magnitude. So this comes goes back to the super delegate that we had uh, in 2016 that caused such a big stir. I thought the Democratic Party had backed off on those large number of super delegates. That's true. This is different from super delegates, though. Okay. This, this is the, these are the voting members of the DNC. So this this is not uh, having to, the, the membership on the DNC is not a part of the presidential nominating process. That that's the delegates. The delegates are the ones who vote on nominating the okay. the party's uh, candidates for for president. The, oh. My membership on the DNC has to do with um, voting about the strategy and the budget for the Democratic Party. So uh, the DNC raises money to support Democratic candidates and develops a strategy for directing that money. And um, so that's the role of the DNC. It's not uh, it's it's an organizational and, uh, and a financial uh, sort of a responsibility that's separate from the nominating process. So you're right. We've made reforms to the uh, delegate process. We had a, an open convention. We have a lot of great delegates who who uh, came and who are going to be pledged to support the candidate that's much more transparent than it was before. And that has been a subject of a lot of reform in terms of how we nominate and how we hold uh, delegates accountable for their uh, commitments in the nominating process. We have reformed that, but the DNC uh, membership that I now hold is a little bit different.
Does that make sense? It does. Thanks. And thanks for the clarification. Uh, my next question is going to be one that uh, uh, you may want to run away from. And uh, if you do, I, I fully understand. The 600-pound gorilla in the uh, room tomorrow night is going to be the how the two candidates carry themselves. Uh, something like 78, 79% of the folks in the you know, in the U.S. believe that President Biden is too old and uh, and not mentally sharp enough to be president. Working under the assumption, and it is only an assumption, that this, uh, this flaw uh, shows through tomorrow night, has there been some of the backroom discussions of a potential brokered convention and for the Democratic Party? You have not had one since 1952. Have you heard any discussion at all? And again, if you want to run away from this question, that's fine. I, I, I have I have heard, you know, public speculation about that, but but absolutely no uh planning or expectation amongst delegates to the convention who are the decision makers about the the conduct of the convention. I think people understand President Biden is an extraordinarily effective and, uh, you know, lucid uh, leader of the of the U.S. executive branch. and, And his record really reflects that. I mean, it's 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 amazing what he has achieved because of his decades of understanding of you know, the workings of Congress and foreign affairs. I mean, we're on the, you know, he has, I think, navigating an extremely challenging situation in the Middle East with acuity. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has a superb, I mean, he's, he brought Blinken from the Senate. Blinken worked with him, uh, you know, on for decades on foreign policy. So I think people have uh, absolute confidence in him, and that'll be reflected in his performance in the debate, I'm sure. And look, here's the thing that I think about, Bill, that would be of interest to a lot of people. There are, uh, even in West Virginia, we saw in our primary tens of thousands of voters who selected Nikki Haley in the Republican primary. That is Republican primary voters who said we, <laughs> Nikki Haley had withdrawn from the race by the time of our primary. Okay, We have a massive complement of, of uh, Republicans and certainly independents who uh, have harbor real ambivalence about uh, former President uh, Trump. And... And that's because he has a terrible record. He left us with a massive amount of deficit spending. He, this President Trump caused a massive amount of economic and public health disruption in this country. He, he fomented division and, and hatefulness in so much of this country. And, you know, President Biden has really just tried to do and succeeded in doing just the opposite, rebuilding the American economy, rebuilding our infrastructure. And that has inspired confidence in people. And I, I think that'll come through in the debates, and it certainly is was clear in the West if, in the West Virginia electorate, which has tended to be very supportive of President Trump. There's a lot of ambivalence, and I think you'll see that reflected across the country. Sam Petzonk, our guest on the program, previous candidate for Attorney General uh, in the state, uh, currently one of West Virginia's representatives to the Democratic National Committee, where you get to be a part of shaping policy going forward, Sam. And, uh, certainly one of the reasons for President Trump's victory the first time around was a backlash by some in the American public over the policies that the Democratic Party was pursuing, which were regarded by those on the conservative side of the aisle as being way too radically extreme. And I think you would even agree that much of the Democratic national policy doesn't necessarily line up with how West Virginia Democrats feel politically. What can you do as the representative from West Virginia to try to bring the National Party back a little bit toward middle America? Well, I think we have, you know, the Democratic Party nationally does share the common that core values of uh, modern infrastructure and equal opportunity uh, that, that we hold as West Virginians. We've always held those values as West Virginia Democrats. Uh, the, you know, I, I want to ensure that the Democratic Party defends what it has achieved uh, over the last four years in terms of the, the billions of dollars of infrastructure, that's bridges, broadband, you know, highway improvements, uh, supporting uh, our uh, 
our health care facilities, which has been the lifeline for, for West Virginia communities and the West Virginia economy. I mean, th- that's the nuts and the bolts stuff of government that has that was always the focus of West Virginia Democrats historically. That's what Senator Byrd and Jennings Randolph and Jay Rockefeller, all of West, West Virginia's role in the Democratic Party has been to support, you know, uh, the the back the industrial backbone of the American economy. That's what West Virginia is. We are a working state, you know, and that's what the West Virginia Democratic Party is all about. And and I think that that the National Democratic Party has still delivers on those values. But we need to uh, we need to ensure that the the public sees that and and that the benefits of those investments are widely distributed. Um, under this administration, we've we've created uh, what's called the uh, regional Build Back Better program, which which in, is, uh, ensures that these infrastructure investments are not clustered in big cities, that they're distributed across our uh, rural counties across America so that the benefits of industrial – I think this is where the Democratic Party really got off over the last couple of decades. They thought everybody's moving to cities, all the investment should happen in cities, and that was dead wrong. And, and But, however, there's been real change in President Biden's administration, the, the, uh, you know, the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor and the Appalachian Regional Commission have really helped to ensure that the investments under the infrastructure law – reach the entirety of the country. So I will stay focused on that. And I think that's the, uh, you know, together with ensuring that those, there are genuine opportunities for everybody to benefit from those investments. That's really what the Democratic Party needs to focus on, in my view. Maria, we have time for one more question. So Sam, what do you say to people who, I've done a little bit of reading on this too, who say that it's not really um, the Biden team, but it's the Obama team that's running everything that, um, you know, and a critic, uh, critics primarily from the Republican side of the aisle. Uh, well, you know, I think that th- that's just false. I mean, uh, Axelrod's gone. The, the, all, all of the old leadership from Obama is gone. I, they, uh, I don't know where that comes from. I mean. B- b- uh, Biden has always had his own economic people, and they have turned over during his administration. So I I also think there's been a real difference in emphasis. I mean, Biden has emphasized rural development and, um, you know, rural infrastructure in a way that that Obama didn't didn't as much. And so I don't see that. I I think that if you just look again at all, all of the Democratic conversation comes back to look at what Biden has actually done. Look at what Senator Manchin has actually done. Over, by my count, it's over $16 billion in infrastructure investment and manufacturing in West Virginia. Uh, it has, has been committed of, under this administration. That means over the next decade, we will see orders of magnitude more industrial investment in our state because of democratic achievements. So I think if you just look at the results, you'll see they are, I mean, with respect to Obama, he transformed our health care system. He did a lot of good for many people, uh, but he didn't do that. He didn't rebuild American industrial policy. And we are seeing the fruit uh, of, of those investments beginning to, you know, to blossom here in our state. I, I think the proof will be in the pudding on the difference there. Does that make sense, Maria? And, it does. And, you know, you know, uh, Maria, the rural health care system certainly um, Obama expanded uh, community health centers. He expanded health care access, and that has been a lifeline to many of our communities. Uh, the federally qualified health centers are the backbone of the health care delivery system in a lot of rural West Virginia. In that regard, it may be fair to say that Biden is, has continued some of the Obama policies, but by and large, he's really shifted and pivoted. And I think, like I say, the, you know, the infrastructure investments are the proof of that. Sam, on that note, I uh, wish you a great day, sir. 